morning, CBC. Good morning. We have a lot to unpack this morning, so I definitely want to get right to the message. But before I begin, I want everybody to get on your feet. Let's stand up. Let's stand up. Let's stand up. I know it's a holiday weekend, but come on and get on your feet. Now, if God, you know for a fact that God is enough, and you know for a fact that he is worthy of the praise, let's give our Lord and Savior Jesus a round of applause. Come on. Come on. Put your hands together for Jesus. Come on. You can shout hallelujah. You can say thank you, Jesus. Come on. He's been good. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Come on. Come on. Come on. All right. Amen. Amen. Take your seats. Take your seats. Thank you. Thank you. If you will, bow your heads. Let's go to the, the, the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you, Father. Lord, we are here, God, uh, to learn more about you. God, we are here uh, because we seek you, Lord. And Father, I ask right now that you open up our hearts and our minds, God, to receive your word. God, Father, that we can learn what you would like for us to do, God, that as we leave this house today, God, that we'll be better prepared for your glory. Now, Lord, I ask right now, God, that you decrease me and that you increase yourself in me, God, right now so that you will get the glory, so that you can get the praise. God, I submit myself to you right now before your people, God, to be used for your glory. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. All right, true story. Not going to believe this, but true story. J.L. Roundtree, at age 86, robbed his first bank in Mississippi. He was followed outside the bank and arrested. He received probation and a fine. Several months later, he did it again. He robbed his second bank in Pensacola, Florida. This time, while trying to leave the bank with $8,000, one of the bystanders karate kicked him and knocked him down. He was arrested. I know. He was arrested, and he received three years in prison. True story. True story. It gets even better. In 2002, at age 91, guess what? He did it again. He robbed his third bank. This time, while trying to leave the bank with $2,000, one of the bank workers was able to get his license plate number. He was arrested, and he received 12 years in prison. He died at age 92. Now, I know some of you all are wondering, why in the world is Charles sharing this story. I'm sharing this story because one, I want you to see how crafty a wicked person can be. Roundtree uses age at his advantage. No one at the bank assumed that an 86 or 91 year old man would ever rob a bank. Now, if we really think about it, how fast could he have really been? Come on, y'all, right? How fast could he really been? The second reason why I'm sharing this story is because of his intentions. When Roundtree was 83 years old, he went bankrupt because the bank pulled the promissory note and demanded payment in full. To be crafty is to be skillfully clever to achieve a goal. One having intentions means to have a motive or a reason to do something. We are going to look at a parable this morning that demonstrates how we have an opportunity to participate in God's eternal plan using appropriate, skillful planning and crafty motivations. Now, I'm going to tell you this morning, God is awesome. God thought of everything for us as children of God. Today, if we listen, God is, you're going to learn that God has set us up to receive additional things in heaven if we do the work right now. Blessing others is something that we all can do. It can enhance one's life. As a matter of fact, it will not only enhance one's life, but it will also affect what one will receive in the next life. We can set ourselves up right now for eternal treasures and friends in heaven if we are clever and committed to the work of the Lord. The title of our message this morning is called Crafty Intentions. Crafty intentions. 
God expects our motives toward others to be unselfish. Therefore, the resources we have should be utilized without agreement or immediate reward. The concept encompasses how we as stewards interact with our personal gifts and treasures through the distribution to others. Everybody say crafty intentions. Come on, say it like you mean it, crafty intentions. You're going to get with me in a minute, but crafty intentions. Go ahead and look at your neighbor and ask them this question. Are you focused on kingdom success or earthly success? Are you focused on kingdom success or earthly success? Before we read the text this morning, I believe that it would be important if we define what is a parable. A parable means to put alongside for the purpose of comparison and new understanding. When Jesus taught in parables, he was given a brief story to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. This morning, we're going to look at a parable that outlines the crafty wickedness of man. Now, if you're listening to this sermon this morning, you are not saved. The message this morning, the the, the text this morning with the parable is going to seem right. It's going to seem right to the ungodly, but I'm telling the saints of God that this parable this morning is, is, is going to be a demonstration of the wicked. The big idea this morning says when born again believers uphold an inward focus on temporary riches and pleasures in this life, we subsequently hinder our rewards in the next life. Now, I want that to chew, chew on it for just a couple of seconds. Just look at it. I'm going to read it again. When born again believers uphold an inward focus on temporary riches and pleasures in this life, we subsequently hinder our rewards in the next life. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 16, Luke chapter 16, and I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. And I'm going to ask why you're pulling that. If you can stand, I, I, I like to read God's word just out of respect to God if we can do it on our feet. So if you will, stand up with me as we read God's word. Luke chapter 16. Looks like everybody has it, so we'll get started. All right. Luke chapter 16, verse number one. He also said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and he said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship for you no longer can be steward. Then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. I have resolved what to do. That when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me in their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly, because he had dealt shrewdly, excuse me. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, If you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, 
or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Let's say amen. You can take your seats. If we notice in the text of biblical understanding, we see that Jesus is not portrayed in this parable. In most parables, the main figure is either God, Christ, or some other positive figure. In this particular parable, all the characters are wicked. This should alert us that Jesus is not urging us to emulate the behaviors of the characters, but stretch us to recognize a larger principle. God sometimes uses the evil things that are familiar to us to illustrate a particular point without praising the thing itself. Because of sin and humanity's fallen condition, sometimes we connive, we lie, we make unholy deals, we participate in unholy conversation, and at times we have unholy encounters. Now, I know that statement was pretty harsh, but if we want to be honest about it, sometimes on our best days for Christ, we find ourselves doing these things. God uses the worldly affairs of man to teach us biblical understanding. In the text, we see a rich owner having a direct conversation with the steward of his house. The steward is responsible for the business affairs of the owner. The owner has now been updated about the behavior of the student, of the steward, excuse me. The steward was allegedly wasting the owner's goods. In verse number two, the owner said, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship. We should be reminded that in this life, our interactions and affairs are being updated before the father. There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Hebrews 4, 13. We are accountable to God. The day we stand before God is unavoidable. It's coming. We will not only be judged by the word of God, but held accountable to the living God who is our author. Charles Spurgeon quoted. He said, each of us will have to give an account of our stewardship regarding our time, our talents, our substance, and our influence. God has given us much, and I'm not talking about material things. God has given us life, and he expects us as his children to be a good steward. Our mandated obligation to God will be to give an account of our time, talents, and gifts used for the kingdom of heaven. For all believers, biblical accountability will be defined as giving an account according to the standards of God's word. Each of us will give an account of himself to God, Romans 14, 12. Our opportunity to be a good steward will one day come to an end. Now, this is key. As you track with me through this message, I want you to understand that your opportunity to be a good steward for God is coming to an end. The minute we were conceived, we were on the time clock. None of us can determine when it's going to be our last time on this earth. But what the text is saying, on this side of heaven, God has called all of us to be stewards. And the word is saying, while we have an opportunity, we need to get busy for the kingdom of God. Give an account of our stewardship are words that all of humanity will hear. Both sinner and saint, whether you like it or not. We're going to all stand before God and we're going to have to give an account of our, of our abilities or what we did for him concerning our stewardship. I got a question this morning. If Christ would put any one of us in judgment right now and ask you to give an account of your stewardship, what would you say? What would you say? You're standing before God right now. And I can tell you right now, when, we, when you stand, you're by yourself. But if God asks you right now to give an account of the things you have done for him on this earth, what will you say? The Bible says that for as many have sinned without law will also perish without law. But as many have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. God's law is written on the conscience of humanity. 
It is written in our hearts. Our conscience confirms this. Our competing thoughts will either accuse us or excuse us. Our thoughts will charge us guilty before God or grant us exemption through salvation. The more we know, the greater the level of accountability. Today we have podcasts, we have televisions. I mean, we, we can get, pick up your phone anytime you get ready. We come to church. The gospel is being pushed all over the place, and we're soaking it up. And that's good because we're supposed to. But what God wants you to know today, that the more you know, the greater the accountability. And that's powerful. I, 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 even when God gave me this, I mean, I'm checking myself. Because I realize that the more God feeds me his word, the more developed I am in Christ, I understand that I'm going to be held accountable for that. Just like you will. Amen? God has a record of evidence relating to our time on this earth. In Hebrew, the word account means to value. We will all give a value of our lives before the Father. In the text, the steward knew that he was running out of time. In verse 4, he says, I have resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. Everybody say crafty intentions. Come on, uh-uh. I need you to say it like you mean it, crafty intentions. Crafty intentions. The interactions of the steward are crafty and wicked, but God uses his crafty affairs to teach us a spiritual lesson. From the steward's statement, we can identify three distinct characteristics. Man's sinful heart, man's temporal mind, and man's eternal opportunity. I'm going to say it again. Man's sinful heart, man's temporal mind, and man's eternal opportunity. Let's look at the first characteristic, which is man's sinful heart. Instead of the unjust steward owning up to what he did, he schemed a sinful plan to manipulate. His heart posture was faulty toward his owner. The heart is our inner being and it reaches beyond our reasoning. Only God can examine our heart and know it fully. From the heart, one chooses right or wrong. From the heart, one chooses life or death. From the heart, one chooses salvation with Christ or damnation without Christ. Corruption comes from within rather than from without. The heart at the root is the problem. When we fail to hold ourselves accountable by not focusing on the things of God in this life, Jesus said from the heart comes evil thought, slander, false witness, and theft. The heart is the tool that God will use to judge us. You better write that down. You better write that one down. The heart is going to be the tool that God is going to use to judge us. Next, man's temporal mind. A temporal mind refuses to focus on the spiritual things of God and only focus on what one can see in the moment. Now, that's the world. The world is worrying about what I'm going to do today, what I'm going to do next week, what's happening a year from now, what's happening five years from now. And I'm not saying anything wrong with planning. But as children of God, the word today is teaching us that we better get our minds on eternal things. This is not our home. This is not. Now, if you think you're going to be on earth forever and ever, we will when the new city comes back. But I'm talking about as far as in this sinful world, you're fooling yourself because it's coming to an end. It's coming to an end. In our humanity, listen to this, the jurisdiction of the mind is limited by time. Therefore, we focus on the immediate affairs of this life and not the eternal things of God. Creation is bound by time. We grow up, we grow old, and then we die. We should live out our faith in God with the love and service to our nature, to our neighbor, excuse me. Sinful humanity opposes eternal destinations. We only focus on the here and now. You know, a lot of people... Waste a lot of time, a lot of time doing a lot of planning and, and, and getting excited about tomorrow and what I'm going to do next year and, and all these kind of things. And what the text is saying that as children of God, it's okay to think about those things, but our heart and mind should be focused on the next life because the next life is what's most important, not this life. 
You can have all the things you want to have in this. It doesn't matter. If God call you home right now, you can drop dead in your seat. Somebody else going to spend it. Come on, y'all say amen. Somebody else can probably before you hit the floor, somebody pulling your watch off your arm right then. Come on now. I mean, I know, I know this is kind of funny, but what God wants us to do as saints of God, we got to be thinking about eternal things. Because when we do it, as you're going to see in the text, when you do it, you now setting up your opportunity in heaven to receive blessings, to receive things. This is the word of God. It's amazing. As a body of believer, God calls us to temporal vocations in our family, the workplace, in our citizenship, and our church. Divine temporal assignment. God puts you with the family you have. Did y'all know that? The job you had, God put you there. The church you attended, God put you there. Everything that's happening in your life, it was done by God. That was his plan. You didn't know that you're going to end up at CBC on this particular day. None of us did. It was designed by God. But what God wants you to know, this is temporary. This is just a quick stop. You know, you're traveling down the road. You stop and get some gas, take a bathroom break. Take a little quick stop, right? Get out, stretch your legs. That's what this life is. It's just a quick stop. It's just a quick dip. Don't put all your eggs in this basket and miss the kingdom of heaven. Everybody say amen. Y'all, y'all quiet on me, but I'm teaching the word. Don't miss heaven because you're so locked in on earth. Life has been so good, right? And you got your mind here, and then Jesus come back and crack that sky, and you're still sitting in that seat. Don't miss heaven. Boy, I tell you, y'all done got quiet on me. Let me keep moving. Let me keep moving. Let me keep moving. Man's eternal opportunity is beyond time. It is the realm of God. He is our everlasting life and salvation. Temporal thinking neglects our future citizenship in God's eternal kingdom. Go ahead and meditate on that. So you keep your mind on this, right? Keep your mind thinking about today, thinking about what I'm going to do on this earth. You're messing with your future in God's eternal kingdom. I'm not saying you're not going. That's not what I'm saying. You're on your way to heaven if you say the same. You're going. What I'm saying is you're messing with your stuff in heaven. Woo! You're messing with that. You're messing with what God want to give you because of the work that you do now. You're messing with that. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I told the first service, Charles Ding will be greedy. I want everything that God wants me to have in heaven. I want it. And so I know from learning, from reading this, I know, get busy for God. Do this. Be crafty. Be skillful with how I do things for God on this earth. And the Bible assures me when I get to heaven, I'm going to receive some things. That's Bible. It's not Charles Dingle. We must cultivate our eternal outlook in order to minimize our temporal thinking and put the internal things of God in view. Jesus rules heaven and earth. The Bible teaches us that because of the gospel, we have a secure place in his eternal kingdom by way of salvation. Lastly, I want us to look at how the steward's statement points to man's eternal opportunity. In God's sovereignty, the unjust steward is commended for acting and preparing for himself the upcoming judgment. But his behavior was sinful, but his plan demonstrated wisdom and diligence. Let us learn from the unjust steward. As righteous believers, we should be diligent to provide for our souls just like the unjust steward provided for his body. In verse 8, it reads, So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. The master is acknowledging that the steward was clever by attempting to secure his future. His intentions were crafty. Do y'all see that? This is what God said. Look at what he did. He said he's a sinful man, but his intentions were crafty. God is telling us to be crafty for the things of God. He said, use that. Look at what he did. Take what he did and use it for my glory while you can on earth. Amen? I want to take a break. Put your hands together for Jesus for this plan. Come on. Let's give Jesus a hand clap. Come on. All right. As a child of God, we must learn to cultivate our eternal perspective by skillfully investing in the lives of others. Just like a steward, we should utilize the resources that God has given us. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. 
If we pursue the kingdom of God with the same vigor and zeal that that the children of this world pursue profits and pleasures, the world we live in will be entirely different. Would y'all agree with me? I'm not talking about works. I want you all to know that salvation is free. You don't have to work for salvation. God freely gives it. He gives it to us. There's no work there. What God is saying, when you give your life to Christ, don't go sit on the couch. It's not time to say, well, Lord, I'm saved. I'm going to just sit right here on the couch and I'm going to wait till you come back. No. The Bible is saying, be crafty. He's saying, because now you have been redeemed, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Now what God wants you to do is take everything that he's given you and he says, start using it for my glory. Start bringing sinners to me. Start pushing the Bible. Start buying Bibles. Start feeding the hungry. Whatever it is, God said, when you do it, he said, I'm going to give you rewards in heaven. Isn't that beautiful? Don't look for it now. You know how, how we like to do something? Be like, all right, what day, what day can I expect to get in that back? You know, you give somebody a little change. Be like, what day I'm going to see you? Next Tuesday? You're going to pay it back next week? God said, no. God said, don't look for the reward now. He said, this life is temporal. It's going to pass. He said, I got you when you get home. Everybody understand that? Man's opportunity, eternal opportunity is right now. Our intention should be kingdom focused. Right now, we have an opportunity to set ourselves up in heaven right now. Did y'all know that? Right now. Right now, you can set yourself up for the next life right now. You know, we wait, we want to wait when I get the glory and I see those pearly gates. That's too late. Your opportunity to be a steward is over. I didn't say you're not in heaven. You're there. But what are you getting? Because did you do anything on this side of it? Are y'all catching the story this morning? Right? This is not a doom and gloom message. This is exciting for Christians because the word is teaching us, be like the unjust steward. Be a good steward over the things that I have. And when you get home, I got you. I want y'all to listen to this. This is not our home. Life as we know it is a lower physical state of being, and it will not be sustained. Eternal life is a higher spiritual state of being that has no end. 1 Corinthians 15.45 says, It is written, the first man, Adam, became a life being, became a living being, excuse me. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. We bore the image of the first Adam's physical state of being, but through the second Adam, Jesus Christ, we will receive our spiritual bodies at his coming. The first Adam's body was the prototype of our lower level physical being from the dust. We are called to enrich our spiritual journeys as a steward who will one day bear the image of Christ's resurrected body fit for the kingdom of heaven. Eternal focus requires us to live in light of God's viewpoint. Eternal focus requires us to be intentional about God's plan. We are concerned with investing the kingdom gospel that brings sinners to salvation. Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing anyway? Right? Isn't that witnessing? See, that, that game plan never changes. You can hear it a different way as you go through the Bible. It's presented differently, but the game plan never changes. We're supposed to be adding soldiers for Christ. That's what God, somebody got you to Christ, right? Somebody had to speak into your life, and here you are. We're supposed to reciprocate and do the exact same thing for others. In verse number nine, it reads, And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. The unjust steward uses master's money to buy earthly friends. As followers of Jesus Christ, our generosity in this life for the kingdom will generate new friends that will last us for eternity. The Hebrew word for mammon is mammonous, meaning wealth or riches. In English, it is defined as money, capital, or funds. Unrighteous mammon or unrighteous wealth means that money is a part of our unrighteous world. Therefore, we should take hold of it and use it for eternal purpose. Financing the kingdom gospel on earth that brings sinners to salvation, when they arrive to their everlasting home in heaven, they will be there to welcome you. Did y'all know that? See, it means something when you witness and you preach the gospel on earth. We're not doing this in vain. It's not in vain. 
God said when you do it, you're adding eternal friends. You're making friends and you don't even know it. But God said do it. And the Bible teaches that if you do it, if these people you affect in your life, if they get there before you, they're going to welcome you when you get there. Y'all see that? God is good. He has us on all fronts. You just got to get moving and do the work. Get off the couch. Be crafty. Be skillful. Do what you got to do to push and support the gospel. This is what God is asking us to do. We sow seeds on earth to increase the harvest in heaven. Who is the harvest in heaven? It's our friends. It's the friends you make. You're not, you're not going to personally know everybody now, but you're making friends. Every time you utilize your resources, your time, your talent for the gospel, you're making friends, eternal friends. Do y'all see that? Our goal is to use our wealth to lay up treasures in heaven. If our motives are authentic, we will have an opportunity to add friends to the body of Christ through our gifts, talents, and resources. God requires us to be good stewards with what he has given us. Y'all, y'all know that, right? If you're thinking in your mind that I did this, I made this, I built this, I created this, let me tell you right now, you're wrong. God gave you everything that you have, God gave it to you. And what God is teaching us, he said, everything that I gave you, use some of it for the kingdom purpose. Don't walk around like this for God with your wallet, with your talent, with your gifts. Don't do this. He's saying use it. Testimony. And this, this is a real life testimony. Um, it, you know, I'm saying this testimony not to push myself up, but it's, it, it fits the context of this message. Whether I tell you this or not, me and my wife, we've been doing it. So it already happened and it's still occurring right now, but I know that it fits the context of this message, so I want to give it to you. So a, a while back, and this is about three and a half, four years ago, my wife and I, we were talking about how can we get ourselves in a position to bless others. I mean, we're one income family. We live on a budget, one income. Five, it's five of us. Got two girls in college. So we, we can't do big lavish things. We can't do it. But we wanted to make sure we put ourselves in position. So about three and a half, four years ago, true story, I was on my way to work and I called my bank. I said, look, I want you to open up an account and I want you to call it God's account. She said, Mr. Dingle, you say God? I said, yes, G-O-D apostrophe S, God's account. Three and a half, four years ago. She said, sir, it's open. The account was open, zero dollars. Me and my wife just began to consult God, and we say, Lord, however you can do it, however you can help us, God, we want to fund this account so that we can give it away. And I tell you right now, for the past three, three and a half, four years, my wife and I have been able to bless somebody every month. Now, isn't that crafty? Isn't that crafty? Isn't that skillful? This is what, come on, put your hands together. This is what God wants us to do. This is what he's saying. There's another family in the first service that they are very skillful with what they're doing. Yeah, I know you all probably don't know this, but they actually started a church in Pakistan right now. They, here, they live in the U.S., but they started a church in Pakistan, and they supplied, send food and money and finance to those people. You might say, well, Charles, how do you know that? I know it because I preached at their church. I did it online. I preached. I mean, it was like 6 or 7 o'clock here. It was midnight over there, and those people were lifting their hands to Jesus. Isn't that crafty? That's members sitting in this church. This is what they're doing. The text is saying, be crafty. Be skillful how you want to push the gospel. Do it. Find a way to do it. God said, when you do it, I got you in the next life. But this is what we're supposed to be doing. God expects our motives toward others to be unselfish. Therefore, the resources we have should be utilized without agreement or immediate reward. God expects us as followers of him to use our earthly resources wisely and generously for the kingdom. We are stewards, not owners. God provides us with everything we have. Do y'all understand that? It's not yours. I know it feels like it. You don't want to get the bank card in your pocket. I mean, I know. It feels like it's yours. Your key fits that house door, right? It is yours. But God said, but it was mine first. He said, you are just a steward. He said, I need you to manage what I have given you. So utilize your time, talent, and your resources for the kingdom of God. 
Does that make sense? Listen to this. I found this from an unknown author. Listen to what they said. They said, therefore, anyone anticipating his end and his removal from this world to the next relieves the burdens of his sins by good deeds, either by canceling the repayment debt obligation of others or by supplying the poor with abundance by giving what belongs to the Lord. He then gains many friends who would declare his goodness before the Lord and secure him by their testimony. Isn't that powerful? When we focus on the lower physical state of being, accumulation of earthly possessions is a false sense of security. When we focus on the higher spiritual state of being by using our resources to bring sinners to Christ, we store up treasures in heaven. In verse 11, it reads, Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Here's the question of the day. I wish I had a drum roll. The question of the day is, can God trust you with money? Matter of fact, hope, let me rephrase it. I'm sorry. The question of the day is, can God trust you with his money? Everybody say, ouch. Y'all, y'all, everybody done got mute on me. Come on. Can God trust you with his money? Because what you have is what he allowed you to have. I think I'm busting a lot of bubbles this morning because everybody kind of quiet. Like, no, that's my money. No, it's not. God has given it. So can God trust you with his money? If God cannot trust us on this side of heaven with using money for kingdom building, why would he release treasures to us in heaven? That is verse 11. Look at it. He's saying, why should I give you riches and treasures in heaven when on this side of heaven, you wouldn't even use what I gave you? That's the text. Look at it. That's the text. Why should he release it? Why should he do it? I mean, you're walking around and your pocketbook is secure. It's secure. It's security. You won't do it. God, so God saying, since you don't want to do it now with this little change on this side of heaven, why should I release anything to you in heaven? Boy, I tell you, that's tight, right? Everybody say Amen. One's earthly wealth that is used for God's kingdom is repeatedly tied to the accumulation of treasures in heaven. Listen to this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Universal goods, money and things can either be lost to thieves and natural forces. Now, let me, let, me, let me set the record straight right now. I'm not saying God said we can't have anything. That is not what the text is saying. As a matter of fact, God wants his people to be blessed. God doesn't mind us having nice houses, nice cars. I mean, having nice clothes, vacationing. God doesn't have a problem with that. The problem he has, when you're so blessed, you can't help anybody else. You just got it all. You can't do anything from anybody. That man on the corner, you don't pass him a thousand times. You mean to him, you can't buy him a hot dog? Come on now. This is what the text is saying. God has given us. He wants us to be blessed, but you got to use somebody for his glory. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm taking it home. I'm getting, I'm getting it in. Those who live for worldly wealth are in inner darkness. Now, I know I just bust your bubble. You can stack it, continue to stack it, stack it, stack it, and stack it. But if this is your focus, you're in inner darkness. If you're saying that I'm looking at all those zeros in my account and I can't give any of it to God, I mean, really? All these people walking around that's hungry and homeless and all this, I I can't share the gospel anyway with it? That's what the Bible is teaching. And so what God is asking us here, be crafty. Be skillful with how you want to bless people. Do it. He's given us a free green light to do it. I want what God has for me. So I want to go home with my wife, and we're going to see what we can dig a little bit deep. What can we do? Because the Word is teaching us to do it. In closing, I need five minutes. Now, this is the holiday message, so I get extra five minutes, right? Everybody, them hot dogs and hamburgers, they ain't going anywhere. Just give me five minutes. (laughs) What have we learned from the parable of the unjust steward? We have learned that God wants us to be eternal-minded with our time, talents, and our resources. 
We have learned that the day is coming where we all will be accountable for the things we have done in this life. We have learned that having crafty intentions like the steward encompasses how we utilize our personal gifts and treasures for the distribution to others. Verse 12 and verse 13 gives us additional insight. In verse 12, it states, if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Meaning, God has provided us with everything that we have. His his expectation for us as believers is to maintain stewardship of his money. He only wants us to manage as a steward. Do y'all see that? That's all he's asking. He said, I'm going to give it to you, but you're just managing it because it's not yours. He said, use it for my glory. No servant can serve two masters. Here we go, bringing it home. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. That's verse 13. If God is your master, you will love him by obeying him while seeking his reward of pleasing him with his money. Our primary objective is to give generously for the kingdom gospel while you have an opportunity. I set it up earlier. You don't have long to be a good steward. If you haven't been doing it, change it today. Set yourself up in heaven. When you see me in heaven, you're going to like, my God, Charles was greedy. You got that right. Because I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do on this side of heaven because now I am accountable to this word. Do y'all see that? Who else accountable? You are. Our primary objective is to give generously for the kingdom gospel while we have an opportunity. If the lust of wealth is our master, we will hate God and his command to love and serve others with what he has given us. Our goal as believers is to emulate heaven on earth as God's stewards. The kingdom of heaven will be many things. But in the kingdom, no one will be hungry, no one will be homeless, no one will suffer, no one will be sad, there will be no war, no greed, no cruelty. All will be replaced with joy. We should use our money, time, knowledge, and energy to bring the kingdom of heaven closer to earth by being crafty with our intentions. I'm done. Come on, stand to your feet. I'm done. That's it. Come on. Let's give Jesus Christ a hand clap. I'm done. The band can come on. The band can come on. I'm done. I'm done. This was not a doom and gloom message. For those of you who are in Christ, you should be excited. Because what you say, you say, Charles, you mean, Tim, if I do all this, this is what God's going to do for me? That's what the Word says. Yes. He said, get busy, get crafty, become skillful with what you want to do for the, for the kingdom of heaven. He said, do it while you have an opportunity. And if you have not been doing it, my goodness, let the day be the day you start. Go home and think about it. I had so many people come to me after the first service with ideas. That that's all it is. God said, just be crafty about it. Be skillful. Figure out something. Go to the game plan. I mean, I don't know. When you're in line at the drive-thru, maybe feed somebody, pay for somebody to look. I don't know, but share the gospel. Is that me? Hold on. Share the gospel when you do it. That's all he's saying. Share the gospel. So in closing, in closing, we're going to pray. A class, not me, y'all. I don't know who's doing that. But anyway, in closing, we're going to pray. And I just want to pray in celebration. We're just going to celebrate God for his system. This is not Charles Dingo's system. This is what the word says. And we're going to give God the glory through prayer. And if you have not made a decision to serve Christ, I'm going to come down front when I finish and just come up. Come up. Let's get you saved. Because if you're not saved in here, the words that I taught this morning don't necessarily apply to you yet. Now, you can give. You can do all those things. But the, the main thing is being saved. You got to be locked in and get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you for this word. God, we love you, Lord. Father, we thank you for how you have thought of everything. God, you have shown us, Lord, that if we do the work now, 
as we share the gospel with everything that you have given us, Lord, your word confirms that you will give us blessings in heaven. God, you said there will be treasures on top of treasures given to us, God, that we will make eternal friends, Lord. So, God, I just pray, God, to just open up the hearts of your people. God, if they haven't been doing it, maybe God bring them a thought or something in their mind where they can become more skillful with pushing the word of God. Lord, we thank you for this glorious message, God, for just showing us, God, what is awaiting for us if we do the work right now. And so, God, I pray for the lost. I pray for anyone who has heard this message, uh, who has not given their lives to you, God. I want to pray for them right now, Lord. And God, as we move down front, Lord, I pray that just prick the heart, God, that they may come forward and that they want to get in line with you by way of salvation. God, we love you and we honor you this holiday weekend. We thank you, God, for your word. Father, we thank you for our church home. God, we thank you for just blessing us. In Jesus' name, let all God's children say, amen.